Yes, sir. 
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, if any of us have lost the joy of our salvation, Lord, I pray that you just restore that unto us, Lord. There is nothing like knowing you. There's nothing like serving you. And we just worship you this day with all that's within us, Lord. You are worthy of all our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We worship. We praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Jesus, you are worthy of all praise. Yeah. 
Jesus, just begin to say his name. Just begin to say his name. Just begin to sing his name this morning. Jesus, Jesus. you. We worship you, Jesus. There's nobody else worth worshiping. Father, I thank you that you have given to Jesus that great name that is above every name. Every name. 
Father, I thank you that there's power in the name of Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Father, we don't understand how that works. But yet, as God, you have the ability to assign and anoint power to a name. And you've done that. And now, the name of Jesus is the name above all names. And that includes every devil, every demon of any kind. The name of Jesus is above every name. So, Father, I thank you. I don't have to spend all kinds of time researching and trying to figure out what particular demon or devil or spirit I'm facing. All I have to do is say, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for that, Father. And I know it's got to be extremely irritating to the devil to know that there are thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands of people all over this planet who have authority over him. <laughs> and Father, this morning I thank you again for your mercy and your grace. Jesus is Lord over this service here and wherever people are watching. So your will be done, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, praise God. Well, guys, get around and shake some sanctified hands. Well, good morning, good morning, and again, I say good morning. To those of you here, to those of you there, wherever there is, that's where you are. <laughs> so good morning. <laughs> that was deep, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Glory. Praise God. I'm glad you guys are here today. Um, you know, it's a blessing to look out there and see. I mean, if, if you weren't here, I'd have to put up a, a few mirrors <laughs> so it would at least seem like there's somebody out there. <laughs> Y'all look just like me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for being here. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Next Sunday, that's a week from today, we will be having a Memorial Day picnic right after the morning service. Now there's a sign-up sheet in the rear of the sanctuary behind the last pew for you to sign up relative to what you want to bring. And... Um, you know, I noticed that there was a strong emphasis on brownies back there, and that's okay. That's a good thing. <laughs> but we want more than brownies, all right? <laughs> so anyway, you guys check that out, and uh, then we won't be having evening service next week uh, because of the holiday, so we'll have the picnic. Then the rest of the day is over, so you guys can just spend time with family or relax, whatever you want to do, but enjoy the holiday weekend. Praise God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to give this morning. You know, I was thinking about so much of what we heard over the years, how that, well, you know, if you don't give, then, you know, God can't bless you. And as I just did a quick, and I mean quick, Genesis to Revelation review in my mind, I'm having a hard time recalling a pattern of a person giving in order to get. I can't recall. Because everyone that I see, in, you know, some folks would say, well, no, but Abraham, you know, he tithed and God made him rich. No, Abraham was rich and what he tithed was not his own stuff anyhow. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. You know, if I had to tithe, I could get in your pocketbook. and <laughs> just <laughs> Here you go, God. <laughs> We're good, right? <laughs> but it wasn't his stuff to begin with. So the point I'm getting at is we've had so many people tell us over the years, well, you know, you, you, you better, if you've got a need, man, you've got to put it in the offering plate, you know, name your seed and so forth, or God can't meet that need, and on and on it goes. 
But I can't recall a pattern of that in anyone's life in Scripture. Some people want to throw out, well, you know, the Apostle Paul, he wrote, I know what he wrote, but he also talked about all the times that he was going through struggle and had basically nothing. So therefore, he wasn't teaching people to give in order to get. Because, see, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, if, if, <laughs> if he was following Christ and giving out of that following in order to receive from God, then he would never have gone through periods of great lack. And yet he did. In other words, the pattern that we see in Scripture is of trusting God as opposed to sowing a seed to meet the need. And with Solomon, you know, God went to Solomon and he said, okay, what do you want? And Solomon said, well, I'll tell you, I'm the king, I need help. I, I need to be able to be a good king. You know, I need insight, knowledge, wisdom. May I have that? And God, now again, you know, I'm paraphrasing. God said, wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. Because you asked for wisdom. You didn't ask for a bunch of stuff for yourself. You asked for wisdom. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm also going to give you wealth. Because you put wisdom before wealth. And then later on, Solomon writes about how wisdom is a key to, to receiving from God. I've heard more, well, I, you know, back over the course of my life, I've heard more teaching about give to get than I have find the wisdom of God. And yet there's more in Scripture about finding the wisdom of God than there is give to get. I do not live under the bondage of God isn't going to bless me unless I put money in an offering plate. I live in the freedom of the completed work of Jesus Christ. And I know the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ. How that for my sake he became poor. That I through his poverty might be rich. And you know what? I am rich. I'm rich because God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. This is peace. This is wisdom. Too many people in the body of Christ aren't relying on that. They're relying on what they have in their bank account, what they have in their wallet as being the key to receiving from God. And that's not true at all. What's even more sad is how many people, it, Christians now, that you could walk through Scripture and explain all of this line upon line and they still are going to hold on to the bondage of I have to give or God won't bless me. What horrible bondage and what horrible deception. If you're born again, you're free. And God wants to bless you. It all comes down to our trust in Him to receive. So this morning as you're giving your offering, if you haven't already done this, just ask God what he would have you give. And if you're not sure about that, then what would you purpose in your heart? Those of you watching the same thing, what what would God tell you? What is God telling you to give into this ministry? What would you purpose in your heart to give into this ministry? And you can give by virtue of PayPal. The link is there at the website. Or you can mail in offerings. The mailing address is there as well. And any checks or money orders can be made out to GCC. But I thank all of you here and I thank all of you who are watching for being a part of this as we continue to press forward into God to see the completion of His will in our lives and in this ministry. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Everybody go ahead and stand as the ushers are coming hither from thither. Praise God.
Oh, Brother Neil, would you be so kind as to pray for the offering today? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And again, thank all of you who are watching for your giving as well. Been, uh, I've received some very positive feedback concerning the conference. And uh, one apparent constant theme concerning the feedback has to do with the praise and worship, how good it is. You know, we're kind of used to it. But we don't want to become comfortable with it, you know. Um, but we're at a place to where we're, we're accustomed to having that kind of praise and worship. So many people aren't. So when they come in, to them, this is like an oasis. They, this is something they haven't experienced before or maybe haven't experienced in years. So, you know, this isn't just about our praise team. This is about you. It's about us as a congregation. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to worship the Lord. You ministered to a lot of people. What a you ministered to me. Praise God. Um, I want to exhort you just a moment before we really get into the, the word today. Uh, you know, there's so much junk going on in the world. And I see things posted on Facebook. Yes, I use Facebook. I use it for... You know, I'll post, <coughs> excuse me, I'll post uh, computer tips. Um, I post things about our ministry and what have you. But I see a lot of comments concerning, um, I, I would say it like this. A lot of concern among Christians that really lends itself to confusion. As though Christians don't understand what's happening in the world. Well... To sum it up, the body of Christ is following the pattern of the nation of Israel when it comes to our walk with God. If you go back into the Old Testament, you begin reading, you're going to see how things seem to be okay and all is well with the Jews. But then they began to stray. They began to embrace things they shouldn't have embraced and they had trouble as a result. In fact, one time, they actually ended up in bondage for 70 years. And it's kind of weird in that the body of Christ, so many Christians, almost seem like what happened back then has nothing to do with us today. And yet in Scripture, we see God reminds us, you better pay attention to what happened back then because that is a type, a shadow, an example that you better not follow. So what's happening now in the body of Christ, it's the same thing that happened back with Israel when they began to rebel against God. And you had, if you study the scripture now, go through the Old Testament, you're going to see that there were, um, well, back then, they referred to them you know, as prophets, but it would be the equivalent of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher today. But you had those people back then who stood up and declared this is right and that is right and we should do this and we should do that. And it wasn't. They strayed away from the, the law. You remember Hophni and Phinehas? You know, they were really messed up. They They were priests. And they would have stood up and they would have told the people, you know, in the, in the synagogue and whatever, they would have said, you know, well, here's the word of God, blah, blah, et cetera, and all that. But yet, you know, they're involved with women. They're, they're stealing. All kinds of stuff was going on. And yet, when the Philistines invaded and Hophni and Phinehas showed up at the battlefield with the ark of God, everybody was rejoicing. Now, listen to this. Because they thought the ark represented an exemption from accountability. What's the modern day equivalent? Grace 
has taken care of everything, no matter what. And we know what happened. <laughs> All of a sudden, they found out the ark does not accommodate rebellion to God. And neither does grace. Yet you had Jews at that time that were doing everything they could to stay true to God. The same thing's happening today. You have Christians who are doing everything they can to stay true to God. So I'm just encouraging you. Stay focused. Stay focused on the Lord. Deception is increasing and it is becoming sneakier and sneakier. And for a lot of Christians, harder to detect. But we'll, you know, there's more to that we'll get into later on. But I just want to encourage you to know, read the Old Testament. You're going to figure out real quickly what's going on today. It's the same thing. Last week, we began a study on uh, prayer. And really, it just, it's not deep calleth unto deep. But yet, at the, for some people it would be. Um, you know, in Romans, you don't have to turn. In fact, I'll tell you what. Why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 6. You know, in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, it talks about being con uh, continuing instant in prayer. And in Colossians chapter 4, it talks about continue in prayer. And then in First Thales First Thessalonians, <laughs> First First Thessalonians, chapter five, verse seventeen, it says, "Pray without ceasing." And so, you know, we were looking at that and understood that this is talking about a lifestyle of prayer. And I, you know, I shared with you last week how that for me the word prayer had become like a an offensive word. Because it presented to me nothing but boredom, dryness, and ritual. You know, I just, I didn't like that word. However, and we'll introduce some other terms here today. Throughout the Bible, you see prayer taking place, even at times when it's not identified as prayer. And I shared last week how that the body of Christ so often is caught up in all these different fads prayer fads talk about you know, like the prayer of jabez and uh you know the armor prayer got to put on your armor and all that and you know the the prayer shawl thing that was big for a long time where you got to have you know prayer shawl before you can pray and on and on it goes so many others that have come along and uh, the thing is when you get into scripture you don't find those kind of patterns you don't find those kind of teachings it's not in there. You'll see references to things, but then people, it's almost like they grab a hold of this and they turn it into something that it shouldn't be. Just because something's referenced in the Bible doesn't mean that is the rule, if you, if you will. And, uh, you know, I shared last time that there are basically three primary purposes for prayer. One is to communicate with God in fellowship and another is to develop an increased awareness of God's presence. And then the third one is to enable God to establish his will on earth. Those are the three primary purposes for prayer. Now you can see subcategories within those, but those are the three primary purposes. And talked about how that um, when we pray, you know, God has said there, referenced um, Isaiah 43, 26, where God says, you know, put me in remembrance. And it's not that God has forgotten anything, but he's wanting us to stay focused on his word. And so therefore, by using his word in prayer, we're using his will in prayer. And in doing this, uh, we'll have greater success as far as our prayers are concerned. And I shared with you four primary reasons for using scripture in, in prayer. Uh, one, God's word is power. Two, faith comes. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. As you're declaring the word of God, then faith is coming. Three, it brings us into agreement with God's will. 
God's will is firmly established in his word. So therefore, as we're praying the word of God, we are praying the will of God. And number four, God only responds to and works with his word. If you pray anything outside the parameters of scripture, you're praying outside of God's will. He's not going to work with that. You know, oh God, kill so-and-so. They've been mean to me. And God said, I, we're not doing that. Oh, but God, you don't know what they did to me. And God, yeah, I know what they did to you. I knew, I knew they were going to do it before they did it. If you'd have spent enough time with me, you'd have been prepared for when they did it to you. So no, I'm not going to strike them dead. So anyway, uh, you know, God only responds to and works with his will. And I shared last time how that the simplicity of prayer has been greatly corrupted by unscriptural and religious traditions and formulas. And I made reference to, um, well, there in, well, here in Matthew chapter 6. We'll take a look at something else. Just look here at part of Matthew chapter 6, where um, in verse 9, Jesus says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we go through this. This is what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And so we've had people stand up and teach us, you know, this is how you have to do it. This is how you have to do it. This is how you have to pray. That's what Jesus said. And so therefore we try to follow this pattern. So does that mean then if I go before God in prayer and I pray verses, you know, 9 through 13. I'm done? There's nothing else to pray about? I mean, is, this, is that what Jesus was saying? Verses 9 through 13 are the sum total of what I'm supposed to say in prayer. But then, you don't have to turn to this. You get over there to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul writes, you know, first of all, pray for those in authority. <laughs> okay, well, now wait a second. <laughs> Jesus says, after this manner, pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But then Paul says, first of all, pray for those in authority. All right, so what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to, you know, hallowed be thy name and then pray for those in authority? But if praying for those in authority is supposed to come first, then I pray for them before I say, hallowed be thy name. Oh, no, what do I do? You see what I'm getting at? And so Christians put all this crazy pressure on themselves. Got to find this formula. Well, I thought, you know, you're supposed to, you know, worship first. And, and then you're supposed to spend time in confession. And then you're supposed to spend time. Okay, now hold on, hold on. We're talking about prayer. We're not talking about what you do with your time. As far as worship, confession, prayer. And all, um, we're not talking about all of that. We're talking about prayer. So, yeah, you should do all those things. You should, hallowed be thy name, praise the Lord. You should. That's not wrong. You should pray for those in authority. That's absolutely scriptural. But the thing is, when you go through scripture, you don't find people following those formulas the way they have been so imposed on the body of Christ. So Jesus says, all right, the apostle Paul says, first of all, pray for those in authority. All right, well, I don't see Jesus doing a whole lot of that. I don't see Peter doing a whole lot of that. You guys understand what I'm saying? So it isn't that we don't do that. What it means is break the shackles of legalistic bondage in your prayer and know that these things should be done, but, but don't feel like, okay, first of all, pray for those in authority. So does that mean if I pray three, four times throughout my day that every single time I've got to go through the formula? Is that what that means? No. So we can get caught up in all of this and we get so, say, worried, concerned, stressed out over did I do it right as opposed to just doing it. <laughs> just get in there with him. In fact, look at this. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 5, When thou prayest. Now remember, he's speaking prophetically, addressing the body of Christ. He's, look, I'm going to tell you about the kingdom. 
So those of you who are in the kingdom, when you pray, so the assumption is you're going to pray. So if you ever, if you have this idea like, well, God, I'm not really sure. I'm born again, but am I supposed to pray? Okay, Jesus answers that right here. <laughs> you know, when you pray, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to pray. Yeah, you're supposed to pray. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. Why not, Jesus? <laughs> Well, because they love to stand praying in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now stop right there. Stop right there. I have encountered so many Christians over the years. They are either blatantly ignorant or they just want to try and start trouble. Because there are Christians who would say something like, no, there are Christians who might say something like, oh, so we're not, we're not supposed to be standing in church and praying. I mean, he says right there, you know, don't be like the hip hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogue. So I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Pastor Jim, you know, you tell us to stand up and pray. Oh, bless God, I will not. <laughs> now, I know it, to you that sounds silly. But the point I'm making is you've got Christians out there, they are that silly. And they'll say certain things. They'll take scripture and twist it into something it's not. He's addressing hypocrites. Okay, why are they doing this, standing in the synagogues and praying? It's because they want people to hear them. They want to put on a show. That's what he's talking about in verse 5. He's saying when you pray, it's not about letting people know how King Jamesy you can speak when you pray. When you pray, it's not about you, you know, it, it's not like a veiled declaration of gossip. It's not like you want to, don't, don't pray to impress people. That's what Jesus is saying here. He says, but you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now some people, and I've heard this, they take verse 7, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, because they think they're, they shall be heard for their much speaking. And they say this verse proves you should not confess Scripture repeatedly, especially in your prayers. I've heard this before. That's a lie. We're supposed to, what else are you going to speak? What else would you want to speak other than the will of God that's revealed in His Word? No, he's saying what they do in other words, let me kind of rephrase verse 7. He's saying the heathen. Okay, think of it in terms as Christians who just don't know squat. And so they don't understand their relationship with God. So they think they've got to keep screaming and yelling and hollering. And, you know, you know I've, got to, I've heard the thing about you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. And I've heard Christians that have used this to mean that when you're in a prayer meeting, if you don't holler and you don't yell, if you aren't effectual and fervent in your prayer, then God isn't going to move. That is not what that is talking about. That's not what that means. Think of it in terms as sincere prayer out of your relationship with God. And so in verse 6, Jesus says, you know, when you pray, enter into your closet when you shut the door, pray to your father, which is in secret. Your father, which sees in secret, shall reward thee openly. This whole thing of, you know, when you enter into your closet, don't, you, you can't turn that into some sort of, uh, you know, legalism. Well, you've got to go, you've got to have a prayer closet. You've got to have a place at home where you can go in and pray. You've got to have a little room, a little prayer closet. Okay, you know what? If, that, if you have that, that praise, that's okay. But to say that's what Jesus is teaching. And demanding that you have a little room. In our house, we don't have enough little rooms. <laughs> Hopefully someday we'll have a house where we can have some little rooms <laughs> for prayer. 
You understand what I'm talking about? Now, what he's talking here about is you create your time with God. And where he says shut the door, he's talking about shutting everything else out and staying focused on God. Okay, now, a while back at the beginning of the year, I taught on corporate prayer. What I'm sharing right now are aspects of prayer that can apply privately or corporately. In other words, when we come together corporately to pray, we want to shut everything else out. We want to be focused on God as we're praying. One of the things that I've heard from Christians over the years so many times, something like this. You know, well, I want a word from God. And I've heard, you know, Christians have come to me. Has God said anything to you about me? Well, you know, that's kind of a loaded question. Because if he has, are you sure you want me to repeat it? <laughs> yeah, he told me you're in sin. No, 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 he did, that wasn't God. <laughs> that was a devil. <laughs> has God told you anything about me? You got a word for me, Brother Martin? Got a word for me? What's God revealing to you about me? You know, really? Seriously? Well, that's happened a lot over the years. Well, I, I want to hear God. I want a word from God. I want to hear His voice. I want to receive direction. Okay, well, that's a good thing. You should. However, this whole aspect of prayer, if you don't like that word prayer, you can call it meeting with God. You can call it your closet time. You can call it your secret place time. You know, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Almighty shall abide under the shadow. He that, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that, that verse. <laughs> See, you can call it whatever you want. But that is the primary setting where you're going to hear from God. More so than in worship, more so than in a sermon, more so than anything else. It's when you enter into that private time with God. And that could be when we're together corporately praying as well. But especially when you're alone. Especially when you're by yourself and you're shutting everything else out. Now, as I was looking at this, praying at the, about this and so on, you know, the Lord took me to Moses. And he began to show me certain aspects or certain things that took place in the life of Moses. And he used them as examples for us today concerning prayer. So I'm going to show those to you. I'm going to share them with you. Uh, turn over to, uh, uh, let's see here, Exodus chapter 19. Turn to Exodus chapter 19. Now, give you a moment to turn there. Praise God. Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, in other words, three months after they had come out of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. You know, Mount Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, meaning set up camp, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mount, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now stop right there. Now here's what we're seeing. Moses was with a whole bunch of people. Million, two million, three million, however many it was that came out of Egypt, the Jews. They set up camp here at Mount Sinai. And it says in verse 3 that Moses went up unto God. Meaning he went up Mount Sinai. For what? To meet with God. In other words, Moses separated himself 
from everything. From, well, now remember, this is before the law had been given. This is before the Ten Commandments had been given. This is before, here's how you build the tabernacle. Here's how you set up the priesthood. Here are the animals that you kill. Here's this, do that. This was before all of that. And so what happened, Moses completely separated himself from the people and everything else that was going on, and he went up that mountain to spend time alone with God. Now, you don't think he had a lot of responsibilities? You better believe he did, because when they came out of Israel, everybody was looking at him. Everybody was depending on him. They didn't have a priesthood yet. What I mean is the Levitical law had not been established. They didn't have a high priest. Aaron had not been appointed to that position yet. So everybody's depending on Moses. Everybody's talking about Moses. You know, Moses, he's the man. But then what, what does he do? In spite of all the responsibilities, in spite of all the people who were depending on him, in spite of everything that was going on, he completely separates himself and he gets alone. He goes up the mountain. For us, we absolutely must recognize there are people who are depending on us. doesn't matter if it's spouse, children, parents, whatever. There are people who are going to depend on us. They're depending on us now, even if we don't know it. There are responsibilities. Every one of us has responsibilities in life. Some of us have similar responsibilities. I mean, everybody in here, sooner or later, laundry has to be done. Whether you do it or somebody else does it, I mean, sooner or later, it's got to be done. Either that or you throw your clothes away and go buy new ones. I mean, that's kind of weird. But you understand that concept. So we all have some responsibilities that are the same, but, but then we also have responsibilities that are different for each of us. And we have to come to the place of realizing, all right, <laughs> I need to go up the mountain. I need to have mountain time with God. And that means I have to separate myself from all these responsibilities. And guys, let's just be flat out honest, that is a battle. It is warfare. All these things that you need to do, all these things you're supposed to do, that's got to be fixed, that's got to be attended to, this has got to be done, etc., etc. But in spite of it, we have to come to the place of casting down those emotional thoughts and reasonings and understand We've got to have mountain time with God. I'm guilty too. Very guilty of this. It's a fight. It doesn't come easy. But we have to do it. And you know, we read this situation, the story. Moses went up unto God. You don't think while he's walking up the mountain, he might be wondering, what are those people going to do when I walk up here? <laughs> What's going on? Man, those two over there, they were fussing like crazy, and this one over here just will not leave me alone. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? This one. <laughs> Oy vey, I got to get out of here. <laughs> In spite of all of that, he had to separate himself for that mountain time. So if you want to call prayer mountain time, call it mountain time. But he went up, and you'll notice that when he went up, to be with God, and what happened? God began to speak to him. God began to speak to him. So many people who are wanting to hear a word from God, is it possible that you're not hearing a word from God because you're not having any mountain time? You're not having any closet time. How long was it when Moses walked up, how long was it before God started speaking? Five minutes, 15 minutes, a couple of hours? I don't know. I mean, Scripture's not really clear about that. But he made the, the, the diligent effort to do whatever was necessary to climb up that mountain. And then when he got up there, that is the place where God began to speak to him. And you'll notice, beginning in verse 4, God is speaking. He says, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then 
Ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay, are you guys recognizing anything in this? In the New Testament? God's prophesying here. And uh, he says, These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came. In other words, he came down the mountain and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Okay, what do we see in this? He got into the presence of God, mountain time, closet time, prayer time, whatever you want to call it. And God began to speak to him. And when God spoke to him, he said, all right, here's what I want you to tell the people. So he came down the mountain and he told the people what God said. He received a word from the Lord. Now you have a lot of people. This is where it can get kind of weird. There's some folks out there, if they come to me and they start saying, you know, I've got a word for you. The Lord told me to tell you this. The Lord, you know, you're, you're a fool if you just grab a hold of everything that comes out of everybody's mouth when they tell you God spoke to me and told me to tell you this. And I mean, you're like capital fool. <laughs> you have to judge whatever you hear from Scripture and you need to go to God over it. There are times when people have said things to me and as they're, as they're talking, I'm talking to God. God, is there value in this? You know, what's going on? And maybe out of the 45 sentences they speak, two sentences have worth. And the rest of it is fluff that has nothing to do with me. And I dismiss it. You better be cautious about these people who think they hear from God all the time. And they're going around telling people, I heard this and so forth. But Moses... In his private time, he received a word from the Lord. Now, this had to do with instruction, not just for the people, but it also involved his calling. And if you want to call him an apostle, whatever you want to call Moses, this had to do with his position of leadership before the people. And so he goes up the mountain, he spends time with God, and God speaks to him. And God says, what I'm telling you, this isn't just something for you. I want you to go back and tell the people. So we pick it up in verse 8. And all the people answered together. Because verse 7 says, And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him. <clears throat> so God gave him a word for the people. And then Moses comes down and he says, Okay, everybody listen up. Here's the deal. And he tells people. In other words, if, <laughs> if he did it, the way a lot of people today do it, he would have said, yeah, yeah, thus saith the Lord. And he would have told everybody what the Lord said. And in verse 8, it says, And all the people answered together <clears throat> and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. I'm sure at that moment they probably meant it. But as you continue to read, you realize they did not do what the Lord said. Not all of them. And Moses, now look here in verse 8, And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And that, what we're seeing here, we're not going to read any further on that, but if you keep reading this, what you see is Moses goes up and he's talking to God. And God tells him what to say. Then he comes down and he says, okay, now here's what the Lord said. And the people said, okay, here's our response. Then Moses went back. And he tells God what the people said. And then God says, all right, well, then go tell him this. So he goes back down and he says, okay, and furthermore, the Lord said. What I'm getting at is this was not a one-time event. In other words, God goes, Moses has mountain time with God. Then he tells the people. Then he has mountain time with God. He goes, here's what the people said. Like God didn't already know. But here's what the people said. God says, well, tell them this too. And so he comes down and he tells them this too. And so this went on and on. Now, turn over to uh, Exodus chapter 34. And again, God is using this to teach us things. Now, what's happened here by the time we get to Exodus chapter 34 
Moses had been up the mountain with God, and the people got bored. They decided, well, you know what? Moses, we don't know what's going on up that mountain. So they made the golden calf. And God, God said, Moses, we're going to have to interrupt this. <laughs> you need to get down there because the people have built a golden calf, blah, blah, blah. So Moses comes down and he sees what's going on. He's got the tablets and he, just, he goes, boom, he hulks out on the people, man. He takes the tablets and just smashes the tablets. You people, what's the matter with you? And, you know, it's interesting. If you go back and read that whole story, God tells Moses, stand aside. Let me wipe these people out, and I'll start over with you. And Moses says, okay, now, God, now hold on here. Take a breath, big, deep breath. Sit back down. Everything's cool. <laughs> you imagine the angel standing by. Does he know who he's talking to? <laughs> God, if you go killing everybody, what are the Egyptians going to say? What are all these nations going to say? That you brought them out of Egypt and you couldn't help them? God said, all right, all right, we'll do it your way. Moses said, yeah, see there? See, sometimes you, you just got to think these things through. And then Moses comes down the mountain <laughs> and he says, Who's on the Lord's side? And the sons of Levi say, we are. And Moses says, take your sword and kill those people. <laughs> That's one of those stories. That just I laugh at that one. <laughs> God, I'll do it for you. All right, just settle down. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> here we have the broken tablets. Well... Verse, chapter 34, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou didst break. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall co come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before the mount. And he hewed two, two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tables of stone. Now this one right here, this one has the potential to upset a lot of people, and that's okay. <laughs> because the thing the Lord pointed out to me in this is, when you come up the mountain for mountain time with me, you need to be prepared for when I speak. In other words, when you go into your private time, your closet time, your mountain time, do you even anticipate that God is going to say anything? Do you even anticipate he's going to do anything? Or is it just a gripe session? I mean, do you go before God with a pad and paper and your Bible? Or if you're not going to do pad and paper, do you have your computer with you? Are you prepared to write down what God says. And if you're not, why in the world should he say anything to you? You're totally unprepared to receive from him. There are people that walk in here for service. You don't have a Bible. You probably don't even have one of your electronic things. You don't have anything to write with. You don't have anything to write on. You come in here totally unprepared to receive from God, and you wonder why your walk is so weak. Do you not understand? This is class. And you're coming to class not prepared to receive from God. Where's your Bible? Where's your pad? I'm talking your, your paper. Where's your pen? When, last week. Last week. At the end of the service, passed out little forms, <clears throat> said, okay, write down the five things that at this moment seem to be to you 
the most critical things need to be prayed about. You know, write those five things down. And you know what? There were people in here you had nothing to write with. You were scrambling to try and find a pen or a pencil. You came into this service last week totally unprepared to receive from God. And you want to know what the problems are. The problems are you're not prepared to receive. You don't believe God's going to do anything. You say you do. But if you did, you'd show up more prepared. This, this, you know, you, if you want to use your electronic device for your Bible, I mean, that's totally up to you, really. You know, I, I joke about that stuff a lot, all right? But I'll tell you right now, this Bible I have right here, it's better than any electronic device any of you have. I guarantee it. No, you say, oh, yeah. no, I'm serious, it is. Here's why. In this Bible, in this Bible, not just Genesis to Revelation, but in this Bible is a Strong's Concordance Dictionary. In this Bible is a Hebrew lexicon. In this Bible is a Greek lexicon. You do not have an electronic device with all that in it. I can outstudy you with this right here. You say, are you trying to make me feel guilty? Well, if you're feeling guilty, it's not my fault. I'm just telling you what I've got is better than what you've got. <laughs> I've been in services before when I've heard preachers stand up and they're, they're talking about a passage and a particular word and something on the inside of me says, wait a second. And so I can go back to the lexicon and check it out and I know they're wrong. Not just by the check in my spirit, but because by definition, they're wrong or they're incomplete. You know, when you go before God, I mean, what, do you, what are we doing here? Well, I, I come to church to praise the Lord. You should be coming to church to interact with God. And if you're showing up, no Bible, nothing to write with, nothing to write on, if that's how it is in your prayer time, you are not approaching God with an attitude of, I'm going to receive something from you. This is not going to just be one way, me yapping at you. No, I'm, I've come to receive from you. I, I come before you, as this says right here, you know, hew thee two tables of stone. Figuratively speaking, God, I come before you with my two tables of stone. I will write what you say. And you, you, you want to hear a word from God. Trust me, he'd like to give you something. <laughs> Maybe not every time you're up the mountain. But he wants to give you something. But instead, too many Christians come to me and they say, Brother Martin, you got a word for me? Yeah. Go up the mountain with your Bible and your pad and your pen and interact with God. There's your word. No, Brother Martin, seriously. I mean, a real word. <laughs> Now, some of you here this morning, and maybe even watching and listening, you're a little uncomfortable right now because of what I just said. I know, what I, I know I'm right. I always have a paper in my Bible, and I've always got something to write with. Always. It doesn't, I mean, when I'm in a service, even times during praise and worship, God will begin to speak to me. If I'm in a, a service where somebody else is preaching, man, I've got, I'm ready to write. I'm ready to do it. Because I know that God will minister to me. Am I better than anybody else? No, but this is something I had to learn. I wasn't like that years ago. But I've understood, I've come to the place of realizing, gee whiz, if I want to receive something from God, I ought to at least act like it. <laughs> God never speaks to me. Well, what's the last time he said anything? Oh, he ain't never said nothing to me. Well, whenever you pray, do you, are you ready to write it down? Well, why should I do that? I want him to speak to me. I, what? Wait a second. And for some people in this room, that's right. Bing, the light just went off. I just felt it. The light just went off. Do you know how much time you've wasted? In all your prayer time and all of your time coming here. God is telling you, this is a day of new beginnings. If you want to hear from me, prepare yourself to hear. For I will speak to you out of my heart. I will declare unto you my will. But you must be ready for my words. Praise God. This is 
this is prayer basics. <laughs> this is the way it's supposed to be. And if you truly believe God's going to minister to you, then, then you show up ready and prepared. Well, but I don't like to write longhand. That's okay. Hey, use your laptop. B just be ready. Just be ready to document it. Now, I, granted, I know. If you're driving your car, you're <laughs> I get it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that closet time. We're talking about that alone time. Okay? Now, if you look in uh, this same chapter, chapter 34, verse 28. No, 27. Now look at this. This continues this thought. Verse 27. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights and did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. 40 days, 40 nights, no food, no water. You definitely don't want to get legalistic with that one. <laughs> Hello, boss. I will not be in for the next 40 days. <laughs> no. You understand what he's talking about here. God said, write it down. And so therefore we need to receive that lesson, receive this instruction, write it down. And here's the thing, Moses didn't have a, a laptop. <laughs> he had, you know, two tables of stone. You know how long it would take to write stuff on table? We've got it easy, guys. We don't have to get a hammer and chisel. Hold on, God. <laughs> what was that second word? <laughs> now in this chapter, verse, in chapter 34, look at verse 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not or did not realize that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron, and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in, the Mount, in Mount Sinai. Now stop right there for a moment. You realize part of what he's doing, he's holding the document. And he's reading it to the people. How many documents have we missed from God because we weren't ready to write it down and he continues here and it says and till Moses had done speaking with them he put a veil on his face but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him he took the veil off until he came out and he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. Are you seeing this process? He goes in to God, comes out and tells everybody. He goes in with God, comes out and tells everybody. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him, to speak with God. So he's got this covering over his face. But you know what was happening. Whatever the veil was made of, don't know. But he's got this veil. But you know that, that, that there was light coming out from the sides. I mean, they would have seen this. Okay, now. Here's what we don't realize. See, in the natural, Moses went before God, and he's there in the glory of God. And when he comes out before the people, his face is glowing. Now, he doesn't know it. And Aaron... He's like, ah, Moses, <laughs> dude, what's going on, man? And, you know, Moses is like, what? But your face is glowing. What do you mean my face is glowing? <coughs> yeah, it's glowing. You know, here, look in the mirror. Your face is glowing. <laughs> and somehow they convinced him, your face is glowing. And so, you know, you've got to put a veil on. You know, it's scaring everybody and what have you. So it's all right. But he didn't know it. He didn't know it. In other words, he did not know that being in the presence of God was enabling him to carry the glory of God when he went back among the people. See that? Okay, the same thing is true for us. Oh, God, we want your glory. Oh, God, we want your glory. And God says, it's right here waiting for you now. 
you need some mountain time. If you come into my presence, then I will share my glory with you because I cannot separate myself from my glory. Now somebody get weird and they say, you mean when, when I come out of my closet, my face will, will shine? No, no. That's because the glory that rested on Moses is now dwelling in you. And that glory increases on the inside to where when we come out, see when Moses, when he came down from the mount, he didn't have to go around saying, hey, everybody, I've just been with God. You hear? I've been with God. I was with the Lord. Yes, I was. He didn't have to say a word. Because the people saw the result of him being in the presence of God. Of him being in in his closet time. The same thing with us. When we spend this closet time with God, when we spend this mountain time with God, however you want to ter term it, you know, prayer time with God, whatever, and we go in there with sincerity, not because, oh, okay, got to spend my time in prayer with God, because if I don't, he's going to get all mad, and pastor's going to yell at me. And all. No. <laughs> now you go, even if you don't feel like it, you go in there. And you say, okay, God, look, I know I'm supposed to do this right now. I really don't feel like it, but I know I'm supposed to. And so it's like, I want to be here, but I kind of don't want to be here. But yet I'm going to force myself to be here because I know it's the right thing for me. And I'm going to do this. And I'm sorry if my attitude is a little wrong right now, but I want that fixed too. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm sure Moses, after a while, got tired of, boy, going up the mountain again, <laughs> down the mountain. At least he was in shape, right? <laughs> and so his, his glory, God's glory rested on Moses. Well, see, when we do this, and, you know, Moses, he keeps going up and down, up and down. And his glory, it's resting on him. We keep having this mountain time with God and his glory in us there is going to be an awareness of his presence on us. And people around us are going to sense something. They're not necessarily going to see our faces glowing, but they're going to sense something. And it's going to be the presence of God, you know, flowing through us, if you will. And if you go back and, and you study the life of Moses, go all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush. And you go forward from there all the way through to when Moses died. And what you're going to see is that this was a pattern with Moses as far as him seeking God and then telling the people. Another way to say it was him having his prayer time with God and then coming out with a word from the Lord. Or revelation from a God, whatever. And you know, somebody, some smart aleck is going to say, Well, yes, but Brother Martin, I have never had a burning bush experience. Like, seriously, man? You don't get it? <laughs> the burning bush is now inside you. It's called your new nature. It is from that place where God speaks. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God still speaks from a burning bush, but that burning bush is the fire of his holiness on the inside. Who you are in Christ. The only reason you haven't had a burning bush experience is because you haven't taken time to really get with God. But interestingly enough, every time you have Mountain time with God. You're at the burning bush. You're there in his presence. And along with this, sowing the word of God is going to help you come to the place of recognizing the voice of God. Because I get it. How do I know if it's the voice of God or my own emotions or a devil? Well, some people, now listen to me, some people are going to tell you, well, if you're there on the mountaintop, in the closet, wherever, with God, the devils can't talk to you. Really? 
Okay, try that one on Jesus. Because if I remember right, the devil spoke to him. <laughs> well, how do I know the difference? The more you read the Word of God, you know, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 talks about, you know, presenting your bodies a living sacrifice and be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know, comprehend, understand, be able to prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And then in Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light, uh, uh, gives understanding to the simple. In other words, the more that you sow the word of God into you, what you're doing is you're training your spirit and really even your own mind toward the speech pattern of God. I don't know if that makes sense. God doesn't speak, you know, I mean, if the only way that God can get something across to somebody is to talk in King James, all right, that's what he'll do. But <clears throat> when you get into the Word of God, it begins conditioning you to recognize the voice of God so that you begin to understand more clearly when he's talking to you. But all, this is all a part of what's supposed to be, you know, our prayer life, our mountain time life, our closet time life, our, you know, secret place with God, however you want to term it, whatever makes it easier for you to get a hold of this. You know, um, many years ago, you know, like 40 years ago, if Kathy had called me, and I answered the phone and I said, hello. And she just starts talking. I'm like, I'd be like, who is this? <laughs> you know, who are you? I don't know who you are. It's me. It's Kathy. Kathy who? <laughs> are you single? <laughs> <laughs> but eventually it got to the place to where now, when she calls me, I recognize her voice. Hello. Hey, it's me. Like, yeah, okay, I know that. You wouldn't have to say it's me. Sometimes I get silly. Me who? Who is this? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> you better know who it is. <laughs> Eventually, we come to the place of more quickly recognizing when God is speaking. But we, to me, <clears throat> as God was ministering to me about this, what really jumped out to me is there needs to be this need for times of separation unto God to where everything else is blocked off. We're there with Him. It doesn't matter if it's bedroom, bathroom, attic, garage, basement, whatever to where we separate ourselves from all else. Does it have to be for 40 days and 40 nights? <laughs> no. Just, look, you know what? Even five minutes like that is not wasted. Granted, it, it should be more. But if five minutes is all you can tolerate to begin with, all right, well, then start with five, but work your way up. And then the other thing is to be prepared to receive, to go in there, with your Bible <clears throat> and, you know, your pad and paper or be at your computer so you can document what he speaks, what he says. And, you know, obviously, likewise, when you come here, you should be ready to receive. Hey, listen, there'll be times when God's going to speak to you in the middle of a sermon. But if you're not ready to receive it, you know, there have been times when I've been driving, God starts sharing something, <clears throat> and I've said, can you please remind me of this when I get home? then I go home, I get alone, it's like, okay, <laughs> what was that you were saying? And then he'll start repeating it to me. Like, okay, type it out, type it out, whatever. Be prepared to receive. This is the university of the spirit in what we're doing here. This is class time. And your time alone with God is like homework time. When I was in school, you know, the idea was you bring your textbook and then when it was homework, well, I had my textbook with me to do my homework. 
and my paper, and I know things have changed today, so much of it's electronic, but the concept's the same. God wants to minister to us, but we have to be ready to receive from Him. And as far as this prayer time is concerned, the more we do this, is the more that His glory is going to be more pronounced in our lives. And guys, I'm telling you, change will come. It is inevitable. It will happen. Praise God. Well, please stand. Praise you, Lord. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for what you shared with us today, and I know that there's more you're going to reveal to us. And, and really, Father, these things are very simple, these concepts. But we have to be diligent about their application in our lives. I pray for us, Father, that these truths will sink deep roots in us and that we'll begin to follow this pattern that we see in the life of Moses. Because I know you want to minister to us. And I pray for me, I pray for everybody, you know, here, watching, listening. That, Father, we will fight and we will win that battle with the flesh over spending time with you. I thank you for this. Your grace is sufficient. I praise your name. And Father, just continue to minister to us and prepare us for what is coming concerning times of corporate prayer here in this ministry. We want to do what you want us to do. And we want your will to be accomplished, Father. And again, I thank you that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. Thank you, Father. He uh, just reminded me that, as far as I know, tonight I am going to be teaching on healing. So, you know, if you're battling a whatever, you might think about being here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> he said, let them go. <laughs> You guys have a blessed remainder of this day. And obviously, again, this kind of goes without saying, but anytime you'd like prayer for anything, you can ask. It's all right. But you have a blessed remainder of this day. Enjoy your lunch. Enjoy your rest. And let God prepare your heart and mind for what he was to do tonight. We'll see you then. Praise God.